several months after that first Bible study, Scott F. Chicago was going through a difficult year that year. And Roger was saying, Lorian, what is God doing? I knew that he was living his life away from God. I knew that he was living his life in sin. And God was touching my heart that I've got to tell this man that he's got to change his life. He's got to give his life to Christ for real. At the same time, I was thinking if I do this, he may very well tell me, listen, it's my airport. What are you doing here? Go somewhere else. Don't tell me how to live my life. Nevertheless, on one Tuesday night on the way in on August, God put on my heart, tonight, if God opens the door, I will tell Roger he's living in sin. He's got to change what he's doing. Sure enough, at the end of the Bible study, around 10 p.m., as we were walking to the car, Roger said, Lorian, I have no idea what to do. I'm losing money here. People are dying here. What do we do? He said, Roger, I need to tell you something. The fact that you're living in sin. He was changing girlfriends one after another, half his age, um, all sorts of things. I said, You've, that's got to stop. You've got to give your life to Christ and let God be the king of your heart. And that led to a long conversation. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, on the tarmac where the planes take off and land, Roger on his knees gave his life to Christ. And that moment, for the rest 10 months, until God took him home, he was not the same person. He was part of the, the Bible studies. He began to help in the, in, the, in the community, left and right, anonymously. He learned all that scripture talked about, the left should not know what the right is doing or vice versa. He was helping people because he wanted to be used by God. And he kept saying, Lorian, let's start a church. He said, Roger, I don't know. We'll do the Bible studies, but I've got a church. Lorian, God needs you here. I don't know, Roger, let's see. Lorian, I'm ready to travel all over the world. Let's go preach the gospel. Roger, I don't know. In December of 2002, we began praying. At the time he gave his life to Christ, his girlfriend also gave her life to Christ, but she picked up her stuff and left. No longer lived together. His daughter gave her life to Christ as well. And we all began to pray, should we start a ministry? And that led from December of 2002 until uh, June of 2003 when we decided, this. yes, now we will start the ministry. Seraphim Fellowship in Jesus Christ, a skydiving church and a ministry that travels all over the country to drop zones. We call airports where people drop, jump out of the air, they're called drop zones, as if we're going to drop you in the zone. Anyone like you and me uh, can go and skydive. I didn't know this until I went for the first time. And the people I skydive with, uh, and when I say skydive with, there's, there's a whole culture there's actually, before we go to the beginning, I'll tell you what's going on. Once someone starts skydiving and if they like it, they become part of a group. There's people that live at the airport. For example, at Skydive Chicago, there's 150 lots with either homes or mobile homes where people either live year-round or they go there on Friday and they leave on Sunday night. You're kidding. Doctors, engineers, lawyers, teachers, pastors, um, all walks of life. People that are seeking for that one missing link in their life. They want to fill that emptiness in their soul. And they're looking for this one thing. And once you skydive, if you were built for it, it is a serene experience. You either will hate it or you're going to think of turning over leaves, rocks, and wallets to find the money to be able to get your license and do one more jump. If someone wants to skydive, they look up in their area, and in the Chicago area, there's several skydiving places. Uh, skydive Chicago is where we're at, then there's uh, Chicagoland Skydiving, um, and they're all over the country, many. And you would call up, you would go to uh, a skydiving center or a drop zone, and you sign up for a class. The class is 45 minutes where you watch a video and you have an instructor telling you what skydiving involves and you can do as much or as little as you'd like. If you want to be the one that opens the parachute, you can open the parachute. If you will be the, be the one that guides the parachute into landing together with the with instructor behind you, you can do so. If you do nothing but enjoy the ride, you just sit there and enjoy the ride. So you go to the drop zone and you, uh, you go, go in this classroom after 45 minutes of instruction to an hour. 
uh, you are assigned a tandem master instructor. He has the parachute, you've got the, uh, the gear, the rig, and you get linked up to him in the plane. You load up the plane, it's about a 10 minute uh, ride to altitude if you ride in one of the planes that have two engines. Skydive of Chicago, we have what we call otters, twin otters. Um, big plane, holds 23 people, and you go to altitude in 10 minutes, and then you watch everyone ahead of you jump, and you think, my, what am I doing here? Uh, my, uh, my blessing, I would say, is my first jump, uh, there, were, there was mostly cloud cover. There were openings, but it was cloud cover, so I saw puffies all over the place, puffy clouds. So I didn't look all the way to the ground. I look at the clouds, so it's beautiful. The second jump, it was all clear. You could see all the way to the ground. Different story. You're in the door, and that's a big decision. Uh, don't grab any bars, because you may not let go of them, uh, <laughs> because you'll be so scared. You, you're told to look up when you jump. The moment you leave the plane, in the door, your heart beats faster and harder than it ever has because you're thinking, I'm going to die. And it's your last decision you'll ever make. The instructor, they have thousands of jumps. They've got dinner plans and they will tell you, so I've been doing this. I plan to go home tonight. There is no danger here. He has a main parachute. He has a reserve parachute. He has a computerized computer in the parachute, as so do I, that if at a certain altitude the parachute didn't open for any reason, the reserve opens automatically. So there are many safety uh, things Play, uh, in place to take care of your life. So you're in the door and you make a decision. Ready, set, and you launch out. The moment you leave, all that fear is gone. And you won't know it until you make the step. Kind of like Abraham leaving Ur. Kind of like Abraham following God out of faith. When you got to leave somewhere and you got to pack all your stuff, you think, what in the world am I doing? My whole life is going in a box. I've got no idea what's going to happen where I'm going. But once you trust God and you make that step, everything begins to be peaceful and falls into place in an amazing way. So you're out of the plane now, and from the noise of the, the propellers and, and the fear and the heartbeat, now it's all peaceful. And you're so far off of the ground that it seems surreal. It seems like you're floating. There's no emptiness in your belly. You're just floating. And you float and you fly, it seems like, for 60 seconds, after which you open up your parachute or your instructor, if you forget to, opens at 5,500 feet, after which the parachute opens up and you glide peacefully. And now there is even more peace, because where you used to fall before, you had no idea what's happening. Now you look up above your head and there's a canopy there, a parachute, and you relax as you fly towards your destination. Parachutes are no longer round, they're square or oval shaped, and they're guided like you would any airplane or any wing. You go anywhere you want to go, given the fact that you can't go up. You're on a constant glide towards the ground, slow as it may be. You're going forward about 30 feet per second, uh, and 30 miles per hour, and uh, you guide your parachute to the landing area, and then you just land like a goose would on water, uh, or like a butterfly on a, on a flower. Uh, if there's wind, your landing is uh, going to be very light. If there's no wind, you're going to come in like a goose over water, gliding and landing on your butt, uh, if you are a student. Obviously, more experience, you land on your feet. Of all the illustration that we can imagine that we present alongside Chris' scripture to understand it better, I found none that compares as far as skydiving to walking with Christ. Everything is of faith. Jumping out the plane, to me, I jump into the hands of God. Every step we make, actually skydiving has taught me to live my life one day at a time, even more so one minute at a time. Because we have such an easy tendency to take things for granted. You wake up every day like you did the thousand days before. You go to work every day, everything is the same. But when you begin to skydive, 
you may not go home that day. Every minute. Once you leave the plane, you have no idea what's going to happen. It is a safe sport. There's many safety things put into place. However, you never know what's going to happen. So when you leave the door, you are stepping into God's hand. And looking at skydiving in life, you skydive for 60 seconds. I see that as living your life for 60 years or so. At the end of 60 seconds, you better have an answer to what's going to happen between you and the ground that's rushing up at you. At the end of your life, 60 years, 40 years, 80 years, you better have an answer for eternity. Because life is much more than what we see, feel, and touch. Our soul is eternal, and so is the decision we make. It's eternal. So as we skydive, we have a parachute that we open uh, at the end of 60 seconds. You need to have something that saves your soul at the end of the 60 years, which is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In our canopies, we have this computer that opens up the reserve in case of malfunction problems. I look at that as the Holy Spirit, always being present, always being quiet, never knowing it's there, always being ready. When everything else falls apart, the Holy Spirit is ready to open up and save and lead and guide and restore. When we skydive, we make many decisions. Uh, for example, if we were to do a 10 people jump, we all have our place that we must be to complete that formation. No one, when we prepare to do a, te a 10 person jump or a 100 person jump, everyone is expected to be in their place at the right time. Otherwise, the jump is, fails. So many times people think of church that no one will care if I'm there or not. If I go to church on Wednesday night, I'm too busy. If I go to church on Sunday night or Sunday morning, I'm too busy. When you skydive, if your, your position is expected to, to finish the formation, if you're not there, it's unfinished. It can't be done. In church, the same. Every person is needed to be there in prayer and in encouragement and, and learning. If you're not there, the body is absent. The body is missing a link that it needs to have for strength. And it goes on and on. And as I present scripture to skydivers, their eyes open up because they understand. So many times, people get hurt in skydiving not because of falling out of the, out of the, the plane. They get hurt in skydiving because they push the envelope in landing. You want to land fast and furious. And you want to impress people. Actually, uh, the most dangerous thing you can ever think before you land is watch this. Or if someone sees people on the, see people on the ground uh, videotaping or taking pictures, they're thinking, oh, I got to show off in the way I land. And that's when they take chances when they should not. And that's when they get hurt landing. Many times in our Christian walk, we think, well, I want, to, I want to so and so see me how I live as a Christian. I want to show off what I know so at that point uh, I can be, uh, you know, applauded or appreciated. Pride goes before fall in skydiving and our spiritual walk. And so on and so on as far as the parallels of how God really opens our eyes to understand that life is never to be taken for granted. You live one day at a time. You live and walk humbly with your Lord and let God take care of 13,500 feet when you fall. You're in His hand. He'll take care of things you cannot see. Through God's leading to name the ministry seraphim, from Isaiah chapter 6, the angels having six wings. With two, they cover their feet, which is worship. With two, they cover their face, which is humility. And with two, they fly, which is service. The Lord uses seraphim to travel throughout the country at different airports. And as I jump with people, as an instructor, as an organizer, I jump with them. We present that at the end of the day or Sunday morning, there will be a Bible study or Sunday morning worship. And people that have grown up in church, I find that 80% of the people that have given their life to Christ have come from either Christian homes, the parents have been deacons, pastors, or a praying grandmother somewhere. And how, now after so many years of walking away from God, they hear the name of Jesus once again. I've had people walk by a Bible study, which we hold in the hangar, in the corner of the hangar. People walking by in the distance with a beer in their hand, listening and hearing and seeing a Bible. They put it down, they come and listen. And afterwards, they come with tears in their eyes and say, I needed to hear that. So we travel throughout the country. We hold Bible studies. We hold counseling, either crisis counseling, family counseling, jail ministry uh, to people that are needed on the spot. And God is the one that always sets up the appointment from one counseling session to one 
helping someone in their home to another. And we hold the Bible studies and our goal is to establish Bible groups at different cities, which we have in Virginia and Mississippi and Michigan and California in Arizona, where we gather together either believing Christians that are skydivers and from there we begin to uh, bring Christ to their friends.